There we go. Okay. Well, it's an honor to be here today and talk to you a bit about some of the research I've been involved in. I grew up in Orange County, California. A couple of you may have heard of that area. It's quite an affluent area. And the pervading ethos when I grew up was that if you worked hard, you would live very well. But then when I was a teenager, I went to Mexico. People worked really hard there, even the kids, but they didn't live very well. It became quite apparent to me that a family's well-being depended upon a lot more than simply drive and hard work. It also depended upon the country they lived in. This experience instilled in me the desire to really understand why it was that some countries were rich and other countries were poor. I decided to become an economist. We economists have long judged countries' well-being according to their per capita income level. With the expectation, of course, that rising per capita income would improve people's lives. But over time, I have come to believe that economists put way too much emphasis on increasing per capita income levels. As Aristotle said, way back in the fourth century BCE, wealth is not the good we are seeking, for it is merely useful and for the sake of something else. So what is that something else that we are seeking? What is it that ultimately improves our well-being? Amartya Sen, a contemporary worldly philosopher, argues that what matters to people's well-being is the real freedoms they enjoy to lead lives with dignity. What if, instead of judging people's per capita income, people, instead of judging countries' well-being on the basis of per capita income and its increase, we turn it around and we judge the nation's success according to the extent to which they translate those resources into expanded freedoms. Freedoms for people to be and do the kinds of things that they value. Freedom for people to pursue meaningful lives with dignity. Might we then not be able to identify or learn the scope to direct available resources to improving lives? And to the extent we could, to the extent there is scope, might we then not be better able to identify the kinds of economic institutions, policies, and practices that would enable us to better translate our resources into improved lives? The question arises, though. What are the real freedoms we could expect our economic institutions to provide that all of us, or most of us at least, would agree are fundamental? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, along with the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, identify a set of freedoms that are considered so basic as to have been recognized as rights by the 160 nations that have ratified that covenant. So what are these rights? If you'd each drawn on up a list, I bet they would be on your list. The right to food the ability and means to acquire sufficient healthy food, the right to health, knowledge of healthy lifestyles, and the freedom and ability to secure access to health care and the other determinants of health, the right to education, the ability to acquire a quality and relevant education and training throughout our lives, the right to housing, the freedom and ability to secure housing that protects us from the elements as well as from disease vectors and has ready access to essential infrastructure such as clean water and sanitation. The right to work, our ability to secure productive work that is freely chosen and provides income sufficient for our families. And finally, the right to social security, the ability to acquire social insurance that provides us support in the event of disease or other disability, as well as in our old age. I've been working with a number of my colleagues, as well as numerous graduate and undergraduate students, to develop an index. 
This index is intended to judge nations according to the extent to which they actually translate their resources into fulfillment of these six economic and social rights. We call our index the SURF index. That's the Social and Economic Rights Fulfillment Index. What the SURF index does is it rates countries by comparing the level of rights they have achieved relative to what's feasible at their per capita income levels. So a country's score is the percentage of the feasible level achieved. In determining what is feasible for a country to achieve, we rely on actual evidence from countries and what they have achieved. So let me give you an example of how we do this. So what we try to construct, or what we do construct, is an achievement possibilities frontier. So what I've plotted here is I've plotted a country's data on a specific indicator that is one indicator of some aspect of a right. So let's say the age 65 survival rate as an indicator of the right to health. And then what we've done is we've plotted country scores on that indicator against their GDP per capita and fit a curve on the outer boundary of that plot. That curve then tells us what it's feasible to achieve if countries follow best practices. So how would we score a country on this indicator? Consider the country that I'm pointing at right there that has the big dot. And it has a score of the, on this indicator of 20 and a per capita income level of $10,000. This country's performance on this indicator would be scored as 20 divided by the height of that achievement possibilities frontier at $10,000. Once we have scores on the different indicators of different rights aspects, we aggregate those into right indices via simple averaging. The SURF index itself is then an average of these right index scores. All right, so now, coming back to my question, what can we learn about the scope there is for countries to improve lives without raising per capita incomes, simply by translating their resources more effectively into extending these six critical rights? OK, here I have another plot. Economists love plots, as you can tell. OK. So, what I've plotted here on the horizontal axis is GDP per capita. Keep in mind, this is the indicator that economists use to assess how well off people are in a country. Okay? On my vertical axis, I've plotted the SURF index score. Those dots, then, actually show country scores for the 138 countries that we could calculate it for on the SURF index plotted against per capita income. What's immediately apparent is there's a lot of variation in the scores the countries actually achieve. So we can look at that at any per capita income level. So here's looking at it at $3,000. You notice Moldova has a score of 94. Guyana has a score of 85. India of 58. Moving it up to $6,000, we see in the same pattern, Jordan has a score of 92, Belize of uh, 82, and Angola of merely 42. If we move that up then to $12,000, we see Uruguay at 92%, Panama at 76, Gabon at 50%. Even when we go up to $30,000, we see a tremendous spread in some cases. Here we see South Korea with a score of 93%, Italy with a score of 80%, and Equatorial Guinea with a pitifully low score of merely 27%. The simple fact of the matter is there is tremendous scope to improve people's well-being without increasing per capita income. What would that really imply in people terms? Let's consider a couple of these indicators. If best practices were followed, we could dramatically reduce malnutrition. Here I've just picked out a couple of countries. There's many more where we could reduce it. 
But as you can see in Yemen, we could reduce the child malnutrition rate by 41%, in India by 33%, in Indonesia by 29%, in the Philippines by 21%, and in South Africa by 22%. Even in Uruguay that scored very high on the SURF index, we could increase malnutrition by 12%. What does that imply? In just these six countries, that's 52 million kids that wouldn't be needlessly stunted. Okay? 52 million kids that wouldn't suffer hunger. 52 million kids whose ability to learn wouldn't be reduced. 52 million kids who wouldn't be more susceptible to contagious diseases and suffer complications at much higher rates, including death, from otherwise trivial childhood illnesses. I could go on and describe with a number of other indicators, what it means in terms of people's lives. The simple fact of the matter is, we already have the potential to dramatically improve people's lives. But you might say, OK, you can improve people's lives now with current per capita income levels. But what if you grew per capita income levels? Couldn't you improve people's lives even more? Isn't the potential even greater? Absolutely, but critically, countries that do a good job of translating their resources into these ex expanding these six freedoms also tend to grow more rapidly. Let me give you some evidence of this. So consider countries in the decade of the 1990s and where they were, and we're going to split them into four groups. Okay? And let's look at how, what happened to them in the next decade, the first decade of the 2000s. So what we've done here is I'm going to split my countries into four groups. So we have on the bottom right side what I will call growth lopsided countries. They had growth rates over the decade of the 90s that were above the median, but surf index scores that were below the median. Then look at the top left one. Well, sorry right up there, surf lopsided, okay? Those are countries that had surf index scores above the median, but per capita income growth rates below the median. Then we could consider countries in the bottom left quadrant. Those are in the vicious quadrant. They had per capita income growth rates and surf index scores below the median. And then finally, we have countries that are in the virtuous quadrant. They have per capita income growth rates above the median as well as surf scores above the median. OK, now let's look at where the countries move. Okay, Let's start out looking at the countries that are in the growth lopsided quadrant. Turns out 44% of them stay there. Okay. But unfortunately, another 44% move into the vicious quadrant. Just 6% move into either the virtuous quadrant or the surf lopsided quadrant. What about countries that started out in the vicious quadrant? Unfortunately, most of them get stuck there. There's a few that move to the surf lopsided quadrant and an equal number that move to the growth lopsided quadrant. None actually succeed in moving to the virtuous quadrant. Well, what if you start in the surf lopsided quadrant? That is, that you focus your energies initially on improving well-being. We find that 25% stay there a decade later, but 68% move to that virtuous quadrant. A few do move to the vicious quadrant, but none move to the growth lopsided quadrant. Finally, what about those that succeed in ending up in the virtuous quadrant? 46 remain there, and another 31 fall back to the surf lopsided. That is, the bulk remain virtuous or surf lopsided, with granted a few falling into the vicious category and the growth lopsided quadrant. So what does this mean? It means that there are potential synergies between expanding freedoms within the constraints of our current resources and, in addition, increasing per capita income. What are the policies and institutions, then, that enable us to do that? Well, this is where our research is currently focusing. And we've identified a couple of things. First of all, it's essential for countries to have in place institutions that mediate social conflict so as to avoid civil wars and the like. But second, and critically, one of the things that has come through most strongly is it's essential to have women's empowerment. 
Now, we've looked at a lot of different indicators of women's empowerment, and whichever indicator we use, regardless of the indicator we use, we find that countries where gender equity is greater, they tend to do a much better job of translating their resources into improved human well-being. What else matters? Checks on high levels of income inequality. Too high inequality destroys rights. What is perhaps not quite as apparent is that high levels of social expenditure on sort of directly promoting rights enjoyment are neither necessary nor sufficient. What seems to matter much more is the composition of public expenditures. And here what matters is directing resources to things like primary health care and measures that would, say, reduce endemic diseases or that would expand access to water. Fifth, we find that legally enforceable right guarantees in domestic law makes a tremendous difference. And finally, democratic institutions and institutions that provide an accountability matter as well. However, not in the way you might think. Okay? What they do is they put a floor beneath which countries will not slip. Okay? But on the other hand, they don't have a monopoly on good performance. The time has come for us to stop prioritizing per capita income growth over expanding freedoms. Gross trickle-down effect is too limited and too late to prevent widespread and unnecessary suffering. We can do better. We can do better by focusing more directly on improving people's lives. Thank you.